Okay, hello again, once again with the start of a new videos series regarding the CCNA, the Cisco CCNA 200-301 new exam that was published in 2020, this year actually. Uh, this is Sajar Gafuri once again from the III channel for networking. We have just finished last week the official CCNA English course and complete English course completely for free, completely with seven chapters built 100% based on the official blueprints of Cisco and also it contains almost 85 videos with 29 hours and all of it is are organized in a single playlist called the complete English course okay alongside with the slides of all the seven chapters so after the series was ended in the final video I had made a suggestion or like a vote asking people that uh, what's next it's either to be or to um, I'm sorry it's either to produce a new course for making an engineer more qualified by practicing a lot more complicated labs and building a new series that's called the mega labs or you can start then by building or I'm sorry by recording or producing another series of videos which is the exam preparation which is preparing you for the exam, what might you face in the exam, what type of questions, what questions, maybe how to solve them, think about them, some notes that you need to know, you need to be aware of, so that it will aid you a lot or help you a lot in passing the exam from the first attempt, and also with high confidence. This is extremely important to be confident in the exam, so that you would complete all the questions without any fear or anxiety or getting confused or whatever okay so the votes actually were almost like nine or ten votes only on that video in the past five or six days most of them like they were like six to three votes for the exam preparation to start with the exam preparation I, uh, preparation I will make the mega lab series later of course after I finish this series of videos this series of videos will be only about like five videos okay because of what's coming right now uh, the new exam, the 800-301, is actually made of currently the candidates that are experiencing the exam and trying this online exam are seeing almost 100 questions. Comparing with the old exam, it was like from 50 to 60, 65 questions in the old CCNA 201 to 5. The new 2020 CCNA, which has the code of 200301, are showing almost 100 questions and by almost I mean some people are seeing 101 others are seeing 102 or 103 and so on this range we can see like from maybe 95 to 105 such so this is the um, an approximate number of questions that you might face the exam uh, why the exam questions were almost doubled and it's still giving you the same amount of time which is 120 minutes if you are a native English person and an extra 30 minutes if you are not a native English person so it's two hours for English people and two hours and 30 minutes or two hours and a half for non-English people who are preparing for the, I'm sorry for are taking the exam or experiencing this same exam so using the same amount of time for the old exam and the new exam but in the new exam the, the amount of questions were almost doubled from 50 something to 100 something uh, how come and how could that be enough in time it will be because of what Cisco done which is in the old exam you were to see four different type of questions the majority of the questions were called the multi-choice questions, the MCQ, where you have a question with four possible answers and you need to choose one of the answers. That's it. You will not type anything. You will not use your keyboard. And maybe even if you are like you have forgot the question, but you know a bit of it, just by seeing the, I'm sorry, just by seeing the choices that you have, you might refresh your mind and remember the correct question and choose it. So that was number one, and that was almost like 60 or 65 percent of the questions of the exam questions type number two of the exam questions were called drag and drops and we will see them in this video also like MCQs drag and drops are like some 
possibilities on the right side left side with the correct or corresponding answer to them on the right side and you need to drag using your mouse a question or a possible answer from the left to its correct box on the right that's it that was also called drag and drops it had uh, high mark points or it had high point weights before like maybe more than even 10 points per each question of drag and drops and they are still showing right now in the new exam so basically by comparison between the old exam and the new one both the exams had MCQs both the exam had D and D drag and drops type number three of questions in the old exam were called like an evaluation question where you will have a lab with routers switches servers and PCs and multi-layer switches and you can access those devices and uh, hit some show commands with no configure only show commands so you can like show version show run show IP interface brief show IP OSPF neighbors show IP IGRP neighbor show IP OSPF database show BGP neighbors or show BBGP in the summaries uh, show IP NAT translations show IP NAT uh, maybe statistics etc okay show IP DHCP binding and show IP DHCP database all on and so on I'm sorry so all of these commands you will choosing them to show to show information from inside these devices to answer four questions four MCQs so you'll have like MCQ number one used to say uh, what prevents having an OSPF peer between R1 and R2 so then you'll have to go to R1 and R2 and make some troubleshooting by clicking on both the routers do some showing commands and answering that question that was called the evaluation exam right now it has been removed for now so far for all the candidates that has been joining the exam in last of Feb March and now the beginning of April all of them are not seeing any evaluation exam at all because actually at minimum it might take up to 30 minutes for one question from you for each evaluation question for, from your time and type number four in the previous exam was called the lab or the simlet where you have a real lab like you'll have a complete lab with the initial config OSPF or AIGRP some servers routers and switches and end -hole devices I'm sorry like PCs and in the end there will be some tasks configure an access list to prevent PCs from accessing server number one prevent another access create another access list for another thing make a new OSPF peer for area one for PC number one and two or maybe network number one and, and so on so there will be tasks and config and maybe you'll get a misconfigured lab and saying that correct it make BGP get peered make OSPF peers so you'll have to delete the old OSPF peers which was which were misconfigured and then you configure a new and fresh and correct OSPF peers which is also right now has been removed so no keyboard, no simlets, no evaluation questions, no labs, none at all. You will get almost 100 questions of theoretical questions so far, like only multi-choice questions and drag and drops. This is what happening so far in April from Feb, March and April so far in 2020. So this new series of exam questions or exam preparations we will discuss and work and try to solve whatever type of questions that you might face in the real exam in the real 2301 exam might not be sure because Cisco will change those questions perhaps every day but this will give you a good idea regarding this so you have a complete course to study and you'll have another series of videos that's called the mega lab for high practical labs highly practical labs or um, some complicated labs that will take hours from you to solve for each lab and then the series of the exam preparation to prepare yourself for the exam and what might you face in the exam to make you take your exam and pass it confidently okay so let's start with the questions actually the, your exam uh, 20301 as I said as I believe in my origin it costs almost $200 in specific way it's $195 so far and I have heard news that the exam uh, cost might be variable I'm not sure but I heard that some people are finding the exam with a cost of almost $300 just like the old one but for me I've tried to book the exam for myself twice and both the time it only asked for $195 
so you can check it yourself from the pearsonview.com website uh, also the exam uh, has a complete score po points uh, score points of 1000 point to pass i'm sorry to pass the exam to pass the exam you will need 825 points to pass the exam so it's the minimum amount of points that you need to score to pass if you scored 825 you will pass if you scored 824 then unfortunately you will fail okay you, you have to retake the exam in about one week minimum duration of time after that you have failed the first attempt so that's why i'm making all those series of videos that, so that no one will fail all of you will study correctly and practice correctly and also prepare correctly so that you will pass the exam from the first attempt so without further discussion let's start with like reviewing some of the questions that my friends my colleagues a lot of people that i know from the networking world suggested that you might face these questions in the real exam so let's prefer for them and let's see if all of those questions or most of them half of them some of them were mentioned in that course that i have made before and see how beneficial that course was Okay, so starting with question number one, and that will be um, refer to the exhibit, which is this photo right here. It's about a topology, and, and there is only one router, which is called R1. And inside R1, as you can see, someone typed the command of show IP route. Show IP route. This is our, some shortcuts for typing show IP route to see the routing table of this router and how can this router see the internet and see the entire private network of this company. Okay, so refer to the exhibit. This is the exhibit. Which type of route does R1 use to reach host 10.10.13.10? So 10.10.13.10, which is this PC right here. Uh, what uh, which route or maybe I'm sorry which type of route does the R1 use okay option number one a default route option number two network route a network route is like advertising a network using either OSPF or static route or maybe any other dynamic route that we haven't learned in the exam but you should not face any HRP, BGP or ISIS you should only face OSPF and static since they were only the two protocols that were mentioned in the blueprints a host route would be like routing to a specific host with a subnet mask of 32 instead of a complete network with subnet mask of 24 or a floating static route so let's see the options down here and the options are like what we can see is that this is a generic route which is 10.0.0.0.0.a this is a class a uh, I subnet you can leave it for now you can ignore it but let's see which of these routes can reach 10.10.13.10 .10. so the first one will be C which is directly connected it can reach 10.10.10.0 slash 30 so 10.10.10.0 slash 30 slash 30 actually is called a point-to-point -point subnet which gives you only four IP addresses inside it. The first one will be a network ID, the last one will be a broadcast ID, and only these two IP addresses are valid to use. So what I mean by that is that using the connected route, we can reach 10.10.10.1 IP and 10.10.10.2 IP address. What actually we are facing is another or complete different subnet which is 10.10.13 so it's not from these ranges at all so this one cannot be okay option number two will be O and this stands, stands for OSPF OSPF can reach 10.10.13.0 slash 25 okay good let's try to see if this one is usable or useful or not because it can reach using OSPF the subnet of 10.10.13.0 slash 25 mm -hmm. okay so slash 25 gives you after doing some subnetting that I've talked about in chapter 1 it can gives you almost 128 IP address starting from dot 0 
and up to 10.10.13.127 so mine is 10.10.13.10 .10, which is from this range and saying slash 32 means that it's a host route but let's see if this one is good this is a probability actually because yes your route can reach 10.10.13.10 this PC in here using OSPF using this option this is a probability but let's see the other options number 3 C which is connected it can reach 10.10.10.16 slash 30 again slash 30 gives you only two IP addresses and since slash 16 is there so slash 17 and 18 are inside it so no definitely not okay and we can use some sort of logic um, and I will tell you what that logic is. C is actually refers only for the directly connected cables or directly connected devices to this router. Who is directly connected here is the cloud, the internet, which is definitely what we are not talking about, okay? Because we are trying to reach this one and there is no other cable, okay? Uh, the other directly connected cable is this one, which has already its IP addresses. So there is already a broadcast domain here. And another broadcast domain here so trying to reaching this PC using the connected is impossible because you need to use a routing protocol to reach this one so we can already take the C out okay so the fourth option which will be OSPF can reach 10.10.13.144 slash 28 slash 28 gives you 16 IP addresses and since it starts from 144 then it might end up to 160 and this is of course not the dot 10 that we are looking for so this one is not acceptable and it's useless okay and finally B stands for reaching 0000, 000. this is a default route by using BGP so BGP which is the protocol that's used here and how did I know that's used here because BGP is used with internet it's always BGP that has it's been using with used with internet and using BGP it's advertising a default route using this is the administrative distance of internal BGP with a metric of zero but in all the cases this is leading you to default route which is to here to this way okay so it's not mentioning 10.10.13.10 actually only this guy here is mentioning 10.10.10 I'm sorry dot 13 dot 10 to, to be able to reach 10.10.13.10 which is this one so we can reach 10.10.13.10 using OSPF and OSPF is advertised here on slash 25 meaning that it is a network route okay it's not a default route default route will reach me to the internet from the router to the internet which is this guy here it's not a host route because OSPF here is used slash 25 and the host route means slash 32 so no it's not slash 32 definitely not it's not a floating static because there is already no static route there is no s mark here at all not for static route and not for floating static route. So the correct option will be B for this question. I hope this was clear. Okay, this is question number one. Question number two that you might also face in the exam. Refer to the exhibit again. Which prefix? The term prefix means an IP and its subnet mask. Maybe 10.10.10.10 slash 24. This is an, a prefix. Okay, so which prefix does the router one use to reach? host a this is router a1 and this is host a this is just like the previous questions with a bit of differentiation using the ip addresses and yes you will face a lot of similar questions in the exam so if you are good and have good skills like in this subject then all of these questions you will guarantee its score or its score okay so which prefix will router r1 use to reach host a option number one Router R1 will use 10.10.10.0/28, or let's see the routing table would be better because there is also show IP route here. All of these options in the first are B B B. All of these stands for the BGP. So this is talking about the internet. I will not use them. 
okay and there is also some c c and c here this is for the directly connected i'm sure that i will not use these why because this router already has a network here from these two points and another different broadcast domain here so this is directly connected this one is not directly connected there is an ip address here making this is a broadcast domain and this is a different broadcast domain so it will not be directly connected Definitely, I will need to use a, a routing protocol. It's either to be OSPF, all of these O's, one of them might be good, or the static. So let's see. Um, let's see. So it's 10.10.13.214. By using OSPF, it either will be option number one. Sorry. Okay, so option number one, which is this one, that would be 10.10.13.0 slash 25. 10.10.13.0 slash 25, just like I've mentioned a few minutes ago, slash 25 gives 128 IP addresses. And it's a 10.10.13.0. So starting from zero up to 10.10.13.127. No, because it's 214. Okay, so it's beyond this network. Leave it. Option number two says 10.10.13.128 as an ID, the first IP address, with a subnet mask of 28. Subnet mask of 28 gives you four zeros in the subnet mask, 28 ones and four zeros. So number two to the power of four, which are the four zeros, will give you 16, number 16. So you'll have only 16 IP addresses valid inside this network. So since this network starts from 10.10.13.128 and it's slash 28, then it, this network ends in 10.10.13. You can add 16 here. So that will be 130, 140, 144. So it's something between 128, 144, yet it does not include our IP address. So no. Okay. And option number three will be using 10.10.13.144, uh, also slash 28. So this starts from 44, and it also have an increment value of 16. So that will be 10.10.13.160. So it's between 144, 160. No, we are 214. Leave it. Okay. Option number four will be 10.10.13.160 slash 29. 29 gives only eight IP addresses because it has only three zeros in the subnet mask and 29 ones. So two to the power of three, which are the three zeros, will be eight. So it starts on 160 and surely it will end on 168. No, this is useless. Okay. The last option will be 10. Not the last option in the OSPF, actually. Not the, there is a static that we might use, but that static is throwing the route to 10.10.11.2, which is here. So this one is definitely useless. Okay, my, you are my last hope. So 10.10.13.2208. 10.10.13.208 slash 29. Slash 29 gives 8 IP addresses. So it's starting from 208. And it will end like in almost... Uh, 216 or 15 as a broadcast ID one of them on the same thing no problem but the idea is that 214 yes it finally happened to become in this range because it starts at 208 and ends in almost 215 so 214 is the one that can use is the route that the router can use to reach this PC so 10.10.13.208 slash 29 which is this one is the correct answer for this question how that was good how that was light how that did not take like an hour from us to solve a drag and drop the previous two questions were multi-choice questions I have a question multiple choices I need to choose one of them or more notice that 
okay let me just give you a note that when there is a b c d four applies always actually i have been like in these are these are five certificates actually not four one of them was broken okay thankfully the frame and glass were broken two days ago so these are five certificates they took from me almost eight exams uh, there is also the OCSE the SPNGN1 so I have almost like with the failed exams I have almost like 11 or 12 Cisco exam I have taken like almost from 11 11 12 ex uh, Cisco exams before online Cisco exams so I know their method by using the questions if you have a b c and d choices then it about it's about to choose one only only one answer to be chosen if there was a b c d e five answers then you will choose two if there was a b c d e f six answers then you will choose only three and if there was only it happens very rarely but it does happen a b c d e f g seven multiple replies i'm sorry seven possible um, answers then you will need to choose four so in all the cases of cisco you will leave three incorrect answers and choose the other corrected correct answers whether it was one two three or four so these are the multi-choice questions and cisco do always do always they are not like other vendors that i have been with cisco do always between two brackets here will tell you that answer two answer three answer four or there was no bracket here for telling you how much to answer then it's only answer one so don't get confused don't, don't get confused this is just a hint for you to note that when you see like six answers then six answers really i should choose only one leave the question again you will see like in two brackets in the question like choose three okay that is a good hint for you so this is the drag and drop i need in the exam to drag this question from here and drop it to the correct fact right here so let's see how we will do that uh, that will be all these six informations and you are it's really really fortunate that they are six because in the exam you might fa face eight or seven possibilities on the left and only six boxes on the right so one of the answers is incorrect i need to leave it on the left i need to choose and then to choose the other correct six answers to drag and drop them to the right so what i'm having right now simply is that i have six specifications or six informations they are random randomly distributed three of them should be for the ftp or three of them should describe ftp file transport protocol the other three should describe the tftp the trivial file transport protocol both of these were discussed in chapter four so just in case you watch the cor my course or another course that you have studied ftp with let's see what we will use this provides reliability you know the answer then previously because just in case you have studied ftp then you know what does reliability means when loading an ios image upon boot up so who does offers reliability the guy that uses tcp ftp uses tcp port 20 and 21 for two data management channels tftp uses udp 69 because it's unreliable okay so since it's reliable reliable then it will be ftp so this is the one answer number two does not require user authentication um, i'm not sure let's jump to the next one and leave it to the final pro uh, possibility uses port 69 i've just mentioned that this is tftp go ahead uses port 20 and 21 i have oh oh god what are you doing okay 2021 so this will be ftp go ahead uses tcp this is tcp let's be here and uses udp this is udp go here okay so this one have no room but to go for the tftp and this is how i do not get confused or anxious in the exam by giving a bit of patience and waiting for the other answers to be eliminated so that i can see that so jumping to uh, chapter number four that i have also i'm, I'm sorry <clears throat> that i have previously discussed ftp there this will be ftp let's clear the screen 
there is FTP. <clears throat> this transfer files like software images. This is using TCP 2021 for control and data channel. There is a relative called a relative called Trivial FTP it uses UDP 69 and it is unreliable. Okay, so I did mention all that in chapter four two months ago. Okay, so I'm good, and you can answer this question using information that I have provided you with. Okay, so let's go back. We have answered all of that. Okay, jump into question number four. Question number four says, a frame that enters a switch fails. Okay, so there is a switch here. And this switch is like having some interfaces are here. And all of those interfaces are connected to cables. And these cables are going to whatever thing. But what's saying is that there is a frame that was trying to enter this switch through a port. Whatever port. And it failed to enter the switch. And there is a frame... And it, I'm sorry, a switch fails the frame checksum because this frame, I believe that I did mention in chapter two that the frame starts with a header, with a payload, with a frame checksum in the end. Okay, so it failed the frame checksum, check, se check sequence, I'm sorry, just the checksum. Which two interface counters are incremented in the, inside the switch? Interfaces counters are some deeply and detailed physical specifications and information about each and every physical interface or port inside the switch. So these are four interfaces like maybe Fast Ethernet 01, 02, 03 and 04. You can use the command of show interface. I'm sorry, this is a T. Show interface. Ah, ah. Okay, fast Ethernet 04 and hit enter, then you will see a ton of information regarding this port. All of those are regarding this port, so they are physical informations. With a bit of MAC address and IP address for this port, but the others are a lot of counters. How many frames that try to enter this port and were failed? Any problem with the port itself? Maybe the port is corrupted. Any problem with the cable? Any problem with the cable power? Just in case it was a fiber optic, etc. From these information, some of them get incremented every time an error happens. Every time a frame fails to enter this port or fails the checksum. Okay, so one of these two counters that do increment in every time that a frame fails are, I'm sorry, these will be the input errors because this is an input trying to enter here, okay, and the CRC. Okay, these two values will get incremented in every time a frame checksum fails to enter a switch. You can hit the show interface fast Ethernet 04 and see that. Okay, I hope it is okay. Uh, another drag and drop okay so this time drag each IP address to its network like we have a network that starts from 172.28.228.1 and ends with 172.28 229 .254. So this is starting from 172 k and ends with 172.29.229.254. So we can see that uh, the distance or the traveling distance or the IP address between these two are almost 512. How did I know that? Because the very first IP address at address here is the okay. Um, what did I do? Okay, this is 28. I'm sorry. Okay, these are similar and these are different. So the increment the increment is starting from this these two octets and going above to these two octets. So let's see. This start with 228.1. So it's 228.1, 228.2, 228.3, 4567891010 9, up to 228.254 and there is more because right after that if we increased a bit 
if we increased only one IP address, it will start with 229.0, uh, 229.1, 229.2, and until we reach 229.254. Mm -hmm. So this means that here I have incremented almost 254 IP address that made me reach this IP address and another 254 IP address to reach this IP address. So I have used 254 twice and that makes it 500 and almost 200. Yes, that will make it almost 508. Yep. With using even these last two, it will be 510. So this means that this network starts from 172, okay, 28, 220, God, 28, 228.0 as a first one, and it has slash 23. Because an increment of 510 requires almost, by using the subnetting uh, videos that I've used in chapter 1, and I hope that you did already study it, you did not jump to here directly, then that will be like needing almost 9 zeros on the right, 9 zeros on the right, so 32 minus 9 will give me 23. So this network here. This network here can be also expressed using 172.28.228.0 slash 23. That will be... Okay, so let's see which one of these guys is slash 23. This one is slash 23 and this is 172.28.228.144. So yes, this one is in the range of this, these and this network. So we can say that this is answer number one correctly okay so this is this is for answer number one and yes you will do all this everything in the exam yes i'm sorry to tell you that but this is a good place to practice them maybe you'll same find the same question in the exam maybe you'll find a similar one maybe you will maybe like uh maybe i uh, did say maybe twice and this is the third maybe and then coming up with the fifth maybe also so maybe you will like improve your subnetting skills in this series before you're going to the exam and let's go to the second network this one starts with 172.28.224.1 and ends with 172.28.231 oh god it's dot 2.54 so this will be 172.280.240.1 and ends with 172.28 Two three one and the very last IP address of two three one, which is two five four. So these are similar. Good. It's a class B so far, and starting from two twenty four, two twenty five, two twenty six, two twenty seven, two twenty eight, two twenty nine, two thirty, two thirty one. Two thirty two thirty one seven octets on the right will kept incrementing until we reach the end of two thirty one. Each single octet contains two hundred and fifty four IP address inside it. So this will be almost like seven multiplied by two fifty four. And anyone can help here. This will be like 7 multiplied by 250, that will be 1750 plus 7 multiplied by the 4 that I haven't used. 7 multiplied by 4, I forgot, no, I did not. That will be 10, 28, so the increment value is 1728. Uh, oh god, 1778. Okay, so these are the IP addresses, all the IP addresses in between the range of these two networks. And that gives us the subnet mask of 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, uh, 128, 512, 
one two one or two four no two zero two or oh, four eight yes so I need this line on the right zero two three four five six seven eight nine ten zeros on the right so 32 bit minus 10 zeros will give me 22 ones is there any 22 here and uh, no but there is a 21 which is even bigger so yes this one does include that okay so one 228 with its IP addresses are from this range so this one matches this one and you'll have to calculate all of that during the exam. Yes, I'm sorry, but you have to. Okay, so this is be the only Cisco exam that you will ever use subnetting with. So you will do a lot of subnetting. And this is something that I've always make use of. Don't worry, in the exam you'll have a paper and a pen. Okay, it will be an erasable board with a, a color black um, or a dark color pen that you can use and you can re-clean it again and during the exam by having like a special eraser or like uh, a tissue with a water or such thing I've been in a lot of experiences actually with that so there will be no calculator I'm sorry yes Cisco forbids that Juniper and Huawei do allow for calculator but not Cisco uh, so that's what you have to do you have to do subnetting all the time so I hope by using these two methods that this was okay and I will rely on you to complete these three. This one is very, very simple. This one is extremely simple because 172 is similar, 28 is similar, 228 is similar. It only starts from 129 to 254 only. That's it. So it's like only the amount of IP addresses between number 129 and 254. So let's say that it's uh, from 129 to 254. This means like 254 minus 129. And the amount of IP addresses between them will be 254 minus 129. 254 minus 100 will be 154, uh, 134, 130, 125. Could it be? Uh, no, I believe this is not acceptable, but yet I believe it's at 120, almost 125 this way. And going here, 128 is good, so take this one on the right 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 uh, zeros is what you need. So 7 zeros will be like 32 minus 7. This will be slash 25. So one of these networks should be slash 25. This one. So 172, 1289, 2250. And yes, this one is from this range and it does have the slash 25. Okay, so we have solved so far three, which are these three actually. The second, third, and fourth, you will need to solve these. Can we solve the slash 28 since it gives only how many does slash 29 gives? Only eight IP addresses. So, is there anyone here that has a range of only eight IP addresses? Yes, this one has a range of from 145 to 150. This is even smaller than eight. So, this one is useful. Okay, this is will be good. So, we have solved four. This one is here. This one is here, this one is here, this one is here, so that's it. Okay, come here, baby. Done. Thank you. I hope I hope you made use of that. Okay? Because I did a lot of discussion about the subnetting in complete five videos, two hours of five videos in chapter one. If you just paid good attention for those videos, it will help you a lot in doing this question in a good way and in a complete way. Okay, so this was question number five. Uh, actually, I was planning to discuss 25 questions in this video. So far, we are almost 45 minutes. So completing in this way, okay, you can pause the video reaching whatever question you'd like. This is depending on your ability to absorb new information and to understand the new questions. Because some people can only study five questions a day. Other can st study up to 50 questions a day. I've started with 20, 
and sometimes I used to reach up to 50 like I kept reviewing some old questions from old versions and books and PDFs etc and I kept making myself with those preparing for the exam because I did complete the course I did complete the hands-on labs course so on and in the past years so this depends upon your ability I will try to finish as much as possible maybe I will finish all the 25 questions in this video for you, you should not watch all the video. You can maybe only watch like five questions, pause it, and rewatch another five in another time. Okay. So, question number six says, How do TCP and UTP differ in the way that they establish a connection between two endpoints? In chapter one, that was the first chapter that I have ever produced. I have talked about layer four technologies, the transportation technologies of this was layer 2 text and now we are having layer 1 text layer 2 text layer 3 which is ipv4 and ipv6 and layer 4 so tcp is reliable slow uses three-way handshake udp is not reliable makes it faster and there is no pre-steps performed no prerequisites and its connection less so this guy on the right is not reliable very fast no three-way handshake the guy on the left I'm, I'm sorry on the right the guy on the left is reliable slow uses three-way handshake and is connection oriented so going back to the question about how do tcp and UDP differs actually they differs that number one okay see there is no choose two so only i will choose only one answer from these and that answer will be TCP uses three-way handshake, I've just said that on this slide, and UTP does not guarantee message delivery, not reliable. So that's it, it's correct. But let's just read the other questions, maybe there is a more accurate answer. TCP uses synchronization packets, okay, which is in the three-way handshake, I did explain that in chapter one. UDP uses acknowledgement packets, no, 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 UDP have no pre-steps performed, so it uses no packets at all, that's it. So this is definitely not. UDP provides a reliable. Go ahead. UDP is not reliable. I've just mentioned that. UDP uses sin. UDP uses nothing, dear. UDP uses nothing. Sends directly. So question number six has answer number A. Not A is not a number. Answer A. Okay, the correct answer. Okay, question number seven. Which 802.11 frame type is association? response 802.11 is wireless and in the wireless chapter have we mentioned the frame types no I didn't but based on some research I believe association response I believe it's the management frame I'm almost sure that it will be the management frame is an 802.11 association response frame okay can even further more search that on the internet or using the official book of the official search guide of Cisco. Okay, so question number eight will be the pen. In which way does a spine and leaf architecture? This was about finally. Oh, let's complete the question before jumping to chapter one. Architecture allow for scalability in network when additional access ports are required. Okay, so jumping back to chapter one. Sorry. Go back a few slides to the architecture subject. This is layer one. Even before that, yeah. Spinal leaf. Okay, so spinal leaf. What happened? Not me. Okay. So spinal leaf was about a spine, which are the like the distribution switches, and the leaf, which were the axis switches. So any axis port will be connected directly to a leaf switch. Okay, so it will be di directly directly connected to a leaf layer. All the axis devices, like endpoints, will be connected like servers and etc. And it will definitely be servers in the data center and in the leaf spinal leaf architecture. All the servers here will access the access layer, the leaf layer, which is called here, by directly con being connected to the leaf switch. So going back to the question, and that question was, in which way 
does a spine and leaf architecture allow for scalability in network when additional access ports are required if you need more additional access points access ports then you need more access devices and that means more leaf switches so we need more leaf switches let's see the options option a a spine switch and the leaf switch can be added with redundant connection between them so why would i add a spine unless all the spines were full that's another reply maybe good a spine switch can be added with at least 40 gig uplinks no 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 because access ports will not be connected to the spine access ports will be connected to the leaf a leaf switch can be added with connections to every spine switch this is something mandatory in the architecture of spinal leaf and it might be the answer a leaf switch can be added with a single connection to a core spine switch no every single leaf switch will be connected to all the available spines above let's see if my diagram was correct or not this leaf is connected to this spine and this spine leaves do not connect together spines do not connect together but whenever you add a new leaf then you will need to directly connect the leaf to all the other spines so what does i mean or what does this question mean i'm sorry is that you can add a leaf switch and connect this leaf switch directly to all the new spines or the, or the old spines and this new leaf switch will increase your access port so question i'm sorry answer number c is correct question nine will be which statement identifies the functionality of virtual machines also chapter one we are already so far we are talking almost everything about chapter one and the bit question of FTP of chapter 4 but okay so the hypervisor which is the one controls everything communicates on layer 3 without the need to additional resources hypervisor communicates on layer 3 without the need for additional resources uh, not sure each hypervisor can support a single virtual machine and a single software no 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 Definitely not. The hypervisor will be responsible for all the virtual machines built in upon it. Okay, all of them. The hypervisor can virtual some physical components like CPU, giving you a virtual CPU, virtual memory, and virtual storage. Definitely, this is the main thing that I've talked about in chapter one. <coughs> I'm sorry. Virtualized servers run most efficiently when they are physically physically connected to a switch that is separate from the supervisor hypervisor uh, no we can create a vswitch and we can connect the vswitch to a virtualized servers and make the hypervisor control them so no this one is definitely correct i'm not sure about this one i'm sure that these are wrong so yes i will go with c because this is definitely correct regarding what we have talked about and discussed in chapter one okay that would be good Question 10, which command automatically, automatically generates an IPv6 address from a specified IPv6 prefix and the MAC of an interface? Uh, we did that on a lab in IPv6. I believe we did that on a lab in IPv6 in Chapter 1. And just in case we did not, what you need to do is that you initiate your pack tracer, establish a router, and to go to one of these interfaces in a router and inside the interface you will hit the command of ipv6 enable and that's it you will create a new ipv6 okay so some other versions do use another type of command or i'm sorry another command to create the modified eui 64 this is i'm talking about in this question is about the link local just in case you have studied ipv6 then you will know that i'm talking about the link local ip address which is an ip address that is extracted from your mac address from the interfaces mac address because each port in the router has a separated or a unique mac address so taking this mac address in a link local eui 64 modified equation will gives you an a link local ip physics address but the question here which command should i type inside the port to generate this link local Number one will be IPv6 DHCP. The, um, I'm sorry, IPv6 address DHCP. We are not talking about a DHCP at all. This is no DHCPv6. 
hitting IPv6 address with this address uh, actually I want it to generate an, an IPv6 address I'm not typing an address here I want the router to generate one if I already have one that I will not need to generate anything IPv6 address auto config this is the replaceable for the replacement for IPv6 enabled so this is definitely correct and also IPv6 address this address link local okay I know it's a link local but link local should be automatically auto generated okay I should not type it by myself okay so answer number C will be correct for generating a link local EUI modified 64 or modified EUI 64 okay so question 11 will be when configuring IPv6 on an interface which two IPv6 multicast groups are joined okay so going back to chapter one just in case you did study chapter one and heading to some layer three technologies like the IPv6 my friend IPv6 is here there are some examples or types which are 2000 colon colon slash 3 is a public this is not a multicast this one is unique local okay so this is not a multicast this is a private and this one this one is a multicast so we need to choose some multicast groups like ff00 colon colon slash 8 ipv6 addresses to join the multicast so let's go back to the question okay and that will be definitely not you not to the 2000 not to, to 2002 not the FC uh, DDC2 I'm not sure that this was a DDC2 maybe it's not okay and FF02 okay there is an FF0 so FF0 is correct uh, there is a choose two here and there is five answers so we need to choose another thing no and no definitely not uh, f0 zero, zero, zero was for fc uh, was for the unique local for the private so it's not fc i'm sorry uh, i believe this one is mistyped i believe this one is mistyped i believe this one is also yeah this should be FF02 colon colon 1. I'm sure that it should be this way. So this will be the other answer. This should have been FF02 colon colon 1 because these are already known and previously seen IPv6 addresses and they are definitely not a multicast address. This one is correct and this one I believe it was mistyped. And uh, let's see if you will see such exam such question in the exam. Okay? So, question 12 is about some information and the answers should be a drag and drop refer to the exhibit drag and drop the networking parameters from the left onto the correct values on the right okay so there is a show IP route here what are those informations default via 122, 168, 1, 193. Dev ETH1, proto static, protocol static. This is a script. Actually, we haven't seen such scripts in chapter 7. Mm -hmm. Let's see what we can do. 192.168.1.0 slash 26. Dev STH1, proto kernel scope. I believe this is Python programming. Hmm. Okay, and there is IP address show Ethernet 1. In Ethernet 1, you will find that the MT of Ethernet 1 is 1, uh, 1500. The QLAN is 1000. This is the MAC address, and this is a broadcast. INET refers to IPv4 address. Good. Let's see, IPv6 is this one. This is a link local okay forever so the default gateway is I need to drag the default gateway to its correct default gateway will never be MAC address uh, it might be one of these three let's see where the default gateway is mentioned 
default we are this one I believe this one will be the first answer okay a host IP address a host IP address will be this one because INET means IPv4 for an interface which is ETH1 so this one is a host IP address definitely an NIC network interface card MAC this is not a NIC MAC this is a NIC MAC this is how MAC address looks like so this is a MAC an NIC vendor OUI which is half a MAC this is a half a MAC okay, this is getting easy and the subnet mask will definitely be this because this is a slash 26 subnet mask okay so we did not we almost did not use this one only for this guy and okay so in five of these questions we have used the exhibit for to answer two of them and the other three will logically because this is a Mac this is half a Mac which is the vendor OUI organizationally unique identifier I believe and also this one is a Mac net, net subnet mask which is slash 26 well, this one was easy okay so question 13 let's hit the pen again what is the default behavior of a layer 2 switch when a frame with an unknown destination MAC address is received how many times did I mention that in chapter 2 once a switch receives a frame and there was no destination MAC address it was empty then the destination MACs will be seen as F F F F F F which is unknown and the behavior will be broadcast broadcast means the switch will receive this frame it doesn't know where to hit it or where to forward it to so it will forward it definitely will flood it to all the other interfaces in this switch except for the interface that it received it from so let's see if flooding broadcast or I'm sorry frame flooding or broadcast behavior is mentioned here because reply I'm sorry possibility number a or I'm sorry answer a is layer 2 switch forwards the packet who said anything about packet we are talking about frame okay let's see consider the same thing they are two switch will forward the packet and add the destination MAC address to its table. It's unknown. How will it add it? It's unknown. Okay, B, the layer 2 switch sends a copy of a packet to CPU for destination learning. It's unknown. How will it learn? Oh, okay. As a behavior. Mm. No, it will not be the CPU. C, the layer 2 switch flows the packet to all the ports except the receiving port in that VLAN. Yes, finally, thank you. The layer 2 switch drops the received frame? No, definitely not, unless you have like some protection mechanism that we have talked about before in chapter 5. Okay, so question 14 will be an engineer must configure a slash 30 subnet between two routes which usable IP address and subnet mask combination meets this criteria slash 30 we can write it in the way of 30 ones 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 uh, 9 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 24 25 26 27 28 29 30 that is 30 okay don't go so far no more so this is how it should be written if you convert this one to decimal all of these will be using chapters one method is like these are for well, eight ones so the conversion chart will be by typing one multiplied by two will be two multiplied by two will be four multiplied by two will be eight again 16 32 64 128 whenever there is a one you will consider the number above it whenever there is a one you will consider the number above it again a one consider the four again one consider the eight and also 16 32 64 128 combining all these numbers will give you two 55. So this one can be rewritten in the decimal language as a 255. This one is similar. This will be 255. This one is similar. This will be 255. And the last one will be 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, up to 128. So only 1 and 2 will not be used like this way. 
this is zero and this is zero so like this is zero and this is zero so this will be four plus eight plus sixteen and that will give me the result of 252 so what I mean is that subnet mask slash 30 will be written this way let's go to the answers since there is someone who is giving interface ethernet 00 with a description and an IP address so number one will be slash 30 this is possible okay number two is using 248 this is not a slash 30 subnet mask answer C is using no slash 30 so this is not a possibility and this one is also a possibility so let's see what's the difference between them this is interface ethernet 00 also this one this has a description okay this will not affect us because it's asking for a usable IP and a mask okay and the IP here is 10.2.1.3 the IP here is 209.165.201.2 you might say what's the difference then let me just tell you something slash 30 gives you 30 ones and two zeros in the end only by using the equation of two up to the numbers of zeros this means two up to the two which are two zeros here and that gives me four so slash 30 gives me only four IP addresses as a total starting from like for this network it will be 10.2.1.0 this is the network ID 10.2.1.1 this is a usable IP 10.2.2.2 this is another usable IP and 10.2 I'm sorry what are this 2.1 this one I'm sorry one dot one dot three this is the broadcast ID this is not usable this is not usable only these two are usable that's why slash 30 is called a point-to-point -point subnet because it gives only two IP addresses the question is tricky usable IP address not addresses a usable IP address dot three is not usable it's a broadcast ID you can never type it inside the router at all so you are useless I'm sorry also you are useless dot two is good because this is also slash 30 so dot zero 209 165 201 dot zero is an ID dot one dot two are usable dot two dot three is broadcast so dot two is usable that's good okay so head with it good well, that was good okay question 15 will be this is the question and this is my red pen which network allows devices to communicate without the need to access the internet uh, this is like building uh, a private network how do you build a private network it's either by it's by using private IP addresses and how you build an internet network by buying or purchasing your public IP addresses so making devices communicate together inside a private network this will be achieved or done by using private IP addresses and the range of private IP addresses are the 10.0.0.0/8 everything 10 is a private and 172.16.0.0 slash 12 just like we mentioned in chapter one is also this one okay just don't get confused this one this is chapter one and this is ipv4 and ipv4 do have types and the private ip addresses of ipv4 all the tens from 172.16 to the end of 172.31.25.255.255 which is 172.16.00-12 and this is the third range so going back to the question you just chill um, 192.168.0.0-16 is also private so going back to the questions uh, the possibilities are possibility number one 172.9 no private start from 16 so 15 and below is public 172.28.0.0 yes because this one is possible 192.0 no 192 starts from 1.168.0 is below that this is public 209 is definitely public it's away from here so B is the correct answer okay
Question 16. Refer to the exhibit which statement explains the config error of this config and the message that was received. The configuration says interface gigabit ethernet 101. Okay. We have access to the config if, no problem. IP address 192.168.16.143. With this tablet mask, this is 240. 240 is slash 28. And there was an error saying bad mask for 28 for this address. Uh, why? Maybe this address is not included in the 28 range. Let's see. Uh, slash 28. What are the possibilities? It belongs to a private IP address range? No, 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 no. This is this is about a mask. It's not about um, uh, you can use uh, be, thankful to the CIDR technology you can use slash 28 with the 192 the router does not support slash 28 there is no such router maybe in the 80s 70s but not now definitely it is a network IP address uh, this is an even number whenever you see an even number I'm sorry this is an old number dot 143 is an old number whenever you see an old number this is a broadcast id whenever you see an even number it is a network id so no this one is not a network id because it's odd it's a broadcast id yeah maybe definitely because it's an even an old number and it's refused so this is a broadcast id and you are trying to use a broadcast id for an interface this is not accepted you can use 142 141 140 Okay, you have in a range of 14 IP address below that to use since it's slash 28. I hope that was good. Question 17 says, which IPv6 address type communication between subnets and cannot route to the internet? Back in chapter 1, when I have talked about multiple IPv6 types and how to type a big IPv6 address. I said that it's really complicated, annoying, and a big pain to give a unique IPv6 address to each interface without causing any duplication. So, there is a very simple way of generating a unique IPv6 address to each interface by using each interface's MAC address, okay, which is just like I've mentioned a few questions ago the link local modified UI64 method so by using the link local method you can create a unique ipv6 address to each interface which is used only for internal communication between the ports this will not be used for internet this will not be routed you need a global ipv6 address for internet so if there was a link local and yes there is a link local it's definitely the answer that was good okay question 18 we are almost reaching 25 question in this video that should be very good okay so question 18 will be where is my okay this is red which IPv6 address block block by block I mean this range sends a packet to a group address one packet to group is a multicast one packet to one destination is a unicast one packet to everyone is broadcast and broadcast is not supported in IPv6 so it's only unicast anycast or multicast this is saying which IPv6 is sending from a single to multi and that will definitely be the multicast multicast we have just talked about a few videos ago it was not the global it was not the link local it was the FF was it yeah I believe it was the FF video let me see going back question I did not yes the FF0 is a multicast IPv6 address so FFCC is a multicast it's not an FC this is a private this is the FFCC dot colon colon slash 8 you can use plus I'm sorry question oh god let's chill okay you can use this one as a multicast IPv6 address okay that was question number 18 question 19 will be Chapter 1. Oh, oh. I can see the CSMA. Okay. What are two reasons that cause late collisions to increment on an Ethernet interfaces? More collisions. Okay. A. When CSMA over CD is used. Maybe. B. 
be when one side of the connection is a half duplex no this will not even work when the sending device waits 15 seconds before sending another frame there is no such device no 15 seconds is killing it's in even in microseconds it's not even in seconds measure to resend frames when a collision occurs after the 30 second byte of a frame has been transmitted no, I'm, I'm not sure I'm not sure really this will cause some latency in the collision or when the cable length limits are exceeded definitely with the copper cables when you buy like a cat 5 category 5 copper cable and says that it only supports 100 meters so you will cut the end and join it and make it extended for 130 meter this will definitely cause latency in the frame uh, transmitting inside the cable so this is correct I'm not sure about this one almost sure about the CSMA of a CD to prevent collision so I will use I will choose AE no not D not B and C definitely not B and C so I will choose AE mm -hmm. I agree with AE okay and I hope that you do too question 20 what is the benefit of using a Cisco wireless LAN controller two types of architectures in the chapter 6 that I've talked about before it's either you have a standalone full access points that each one of them must be accessed individually and configured individually or you should <coughs> buy I'm sorry a lightweight access points and make all of them connect to a switch and this switch will be connected to a controller and you will only access the controller the controller will controls all those lightweight access points so what's the benefit of a controller it eliminates the need to configure each access point individually yes any other option maybe central IP management requires more complex it's definitely not more complex it's much more simplified unique SSIDs cannot use the same authentication method why not no I've talked about that in the Wi-Fi security I believe it support autonomous and lightweight APs no controllers do only support lightweight APs lightweight access points which are labs LAPs autonomous do not get connected to controllers okay so answer a is the correct one this is question 20 question 21 which action is taken by a switch port enabled for poe power of ethernet power classification override if a monitored port exceeds the maximum administrative value for power the port is shut it down maybe like if a port should only use 15 watt and it's using like 20 it will get a shutdown so okay or when a power device begins drawing power from the poe switch port a syslog message is generated so number uh, answer a is to shut down the port answer b is not to shut down the port and not to limit the power but only to generate a syslog C, as power usage on a POE switch port is checked, data flow on the connected device is paused. So the port will not get shut down, but data flow will no, no, no. POE will not affect the power of the data at all. D, if a switch determines that or determines that a device is using less than the minimum configured power, it assumes the device has failed and disconnects it no actually it will retransmit a lower wattage for the device instead of disabling it so i will go with a okay so let's take the pen and i will go with a shut down the device and make it error disabled you need to sh shut it and unshut it manual then to fix it and re enable the port later after fixing the problem okay so question number 22 this will be which statement about link aggregation when implementing on a Cisco wireless LAN controller uh, in chapter 6 we have that let me show you that I've talked about like P chapter 6 uh, more details there was a slide called notes positioning 
this is modes and there is notes yes this is notes and notes saying to bundle or aggregate ports in a controller just like the question says you can use channel group mode on command on the switch because the WLC does not support lag P or PAG P okay good let's go back and see if this information is helpful in any way okay, the question says which statement about link aggregation when implementing on a Cisco wireless LAN is true? The Ether channel must be configured in mode active. No, 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 no. I just said that it does not support like P and like we use is active. When enabled, the link aggregation, the WLC bandwidth drops to 500 megabit per second. No. To pass client traffic, two or more ports must be configured. Actually, even if you are enabling bundling and there is only one interface inside the bundle, it will work. In routers, switches, and other devices, enabling like P or bundling or aggregating, even in non Cisco devices, it just requires to have at least one port enabled, and then later in the future, you can just add multiple points inside this virtual lag p port so to pass client traffic two or more ports must be configured uh, no one port will be enough believe me i've been with that in the devices before so d and hopefully d is the correct uh, if i'm not mistaken one functional physical port is needed to pass client traffic yes and it's saying functional by functional i mean i might already have configured two ports inside the aggregation of the WLC maybe one of them failed and went down does that mean that the traffic will go down no the traffic will keep flowing and the other physical and functional interface until the other failed interface gets fixed and go back operating so don't worry having only one interface with like P will work until the other one is fixed okay so which two conditions must be met before SSH can operate normally on a Cisco IOS switch? We did a lab on a switch using SSH and we have configured all the six pre-steps of SSH and I've also added a default gateway, IP default gateway command in the switch heading it back to the router and then from the PC I have accessed the router the switch remotely using SSH so there is a lab for that so I need to choose two and it's five answers so let's see uh, the two conditions that may, must be met before SSH can operate two conditions must be met before means a prerequisite A IP routing must be enabled on the switch switch does not support routing it's a layer 2 switch a console password must be configured on the switch uh, no console is something in the management plane and uh, passing through another devices is using the data plane no telnet must be disabled on the switch no you can enable telnet and ssh at the same time the switch must be running a k9 ios image actually Pactracer did not does, did not verify that but uh, crypto k9 is for ipsec i believe uh, it's not for that so let me see the other one the ip domain name command must be configured on the switch definitely that was one of the prerequisites since it's choose to and those are definitely wrong then i will go with d also so it will be d e okay so the ip domain command i did that but we did not check a version in the ios uh, image in the ios image we did not check that in the pack tracer and it seems that it does affect so we will need a minimum of k9 crypto ios image installed and that's inside the switch to be able to run and use SSH. I refer to the exhibit. This is exhibit with some commands. Which password must an engineer use to enter the enable mode? This is enable secret. Okay, so let's see if enable secret is here or enable password. So this will be config T triple A new model. This is some triple A config that was removed before from this CCNA. Line VTY 0 to 4 login authentication default exit there is a username password username and password this is for entering the device and there is an enable password and enable secret there is enable password and there is an enable secret i believe having two passwords the other one will override the first one why I'm saying that because 
Cisco 123 is here and testing 1234 is here so which one of them I believe the other one the new one will override the old one so this will be wrong of course it's not admin admin or default so it will be this one testing 1234 I will go with this one and I'm sure that it will work okay one last question to finish this video okay this one says refer to the exhibit two switches 802.20q between them meaning that this port is trunk this port is trunk just like we've seen in chapter 2 this is fast ethernet 0101 which action do the switches take on the trunk link uh, oh based on the config switch 1 says interface fast ethernet 01 encapsulation dot 20q so it's 802.20q okay uh, the native vlan will be 999 native vlan means this is the vlan that will travel carrying no tag okay uh okay let's see and switch port mode trunk okay it's trunk thank you the other switch also zero one also encapsulation dot one q and native vlan is different okay switch port mode trunk which, act, which action do, do the switches take for this trunk link? It's not saying about data flooding, saying that after you configure this, what will happen immediately? The trunk does not form. Uh, no, 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 no. Trunk is not related to having a faulty native VLAN. No, no. A native VLAN will pass it through a trunk interface without a tag, just like it's an access interface. It doesn't have a tag. It does not tag a thing, or, or it removes tags from the VLAN ID inside the frame of the uh, inside the frame itself. Okay, so this is not related. Trunk will form. The trunk forms okay, but the mismatched native VLAN are merged into a single broadcast domain. And anyone see? What? The trunk do forms. Thank you, but the mismatched native VLANs, which are 999 and 99 are merged into a single broadcast domain we are already in a single broadcast domain it's it switches already both of them do operate in a single broadcast domain let's see answer c the trunk forms okay but vlan 99 and 999 are in shutdown state actually these are not interface vlans to be shut down these are not layer 3 vlans they are they are layer 2 the trunk does not form this is not accepted. The trunk will form. So A and D definitely not. Uh, 99, 99, 9 uh, will not be shut down because these are not interface VLAN. These are not layer 3 VLAN. These are layer 2 VLANs. And yes, there is a layer 3 VLAN. Don't, don't hate me. There is a layer 3 VLAN that you will see in the Mega Lab coming uh, video, seri video series. Okay? It was removed from the new CC actually. It was a part of the subject that, that was called Inter VLAN Routing. You can use either one of two methods, which is either a router on a stick, ROIS, which uses routers and sub-interfaces, or a multi-layer switch with a method called SVI, switch virtual interface, and that is using a layer 3 VLANs, interface VLAN. Okay, so since all of those are incorrect, and then since there is a trunk, okay, uh, there is a single broadcast domain already, so I will go with B. I don't find that. Okay, so that would be good. Okay, that's it. That should be good for you. What I will do is that uh, this is a blank page. I will just type the answers that I have answered in this question, but uh, I will not type the answers of. I'm sorry, it has been almost 90 minutes. I need to change my seat. Yes, so in this blank page, I will only type the answers of these 25 questions. The drag and drop, I will not type its answer because it's all about drag and drop, so you need to watch the video. But just to check with yourself in the end of this video and the end of the slide, just in case you have printed the slide on paper and you want to see the correction, you see that did I do good? And yes, you did. Okay, so thanks a lot for watching. I need your comments, your uh, review, your opinion, your suggestion before recording the next video. Having 25 video, meaning uh, 25 or oh, 25 questions in video, meaning that this series will have from uh, about four or five videos for preparation. 
but since that there might be some updates so this series will keep updating in the future so this will be the april update this 100 question of april and the upcoming videos or maybe in may june july there will be more videos coming for maybe more questions that you might see in the exam okay so thanks a lot for watching i hope that you'd make some did make some use of this video and it helped you with understanding the exam nature and the questions also and i would like to see you in another upcoming video so thanks again and goodbye